Hi, I'm Doug Carroll for InsidersGuideToFinance.com with a video presentation on futures and forward contracts. So what's the difference between the two? Boil down to their bare essentials, nothing. Economically, the two are effectively equivalent. Now you might say, wait a minute, there's futures and there's forwards. Well, there are technical differences between the two, clearly. But as we'll see, the differences are mere details. Who determines the terms of the contract? Who is the legal counterparty after the contract is created? And how do you manage the credit risk between the legal counterparties? In terms of those details, futures and forwards are different from one another. But in terms of economic substance, they're basically the same. The pricing models for the two, the same. The risk management, hedging applications, positioning uses, exactly the same. But you might say, wait a minute, there, there are futures and forwards. They must be different. Well, what are the common definitions of the two? Futures are most commonly defined how? As exchange traded forwards. And how are forward contracts typically defined? As over-the-counter futures. The circularity of those definitions are clearly completely unenlightening but they do bespeak to the, the basic economic similarity that I identified previously. So let's talk about the two and we'll identify their common features, but importantly, we'll also identify the details that distinguish between the two. The common features? Well, either futures or forward contracts have a futurity aspect to them. In other words, by trading a futures or forward contract today to establish a position, you're locking in a future transaction price. Now, price I'm using as a shorthand for value. Depending upon the nature of the related instrument, it might be a price or an exchange rate or an interest rate. But the point is by establishing a position in futures or forwards today, you're locking in the price or value of a transaction at some point in the future. And the other similarity between the two is any party to a futures or forward contract is incurring a legal obligation to do something. To illustrate, for a futures or forward with a delivery feature, the short incurs the obligation to make delivery, the long incurs the obligation to take delivery. So in those two regards, the futurity aspect and the contractual commitments, futures and forwards are, are the same. Then how do they differ? Well, consider the diagrams of the two in general. Forward contracts are over-the-counter bilateral contracts with two counterparties, the long and the short, the buyer and seller. And the two negotiate all aspects of their contractual relationship. What's the related security or commodity or instrument? Gold, treasury bills, S&P common stocks, British pounds, whatever the contract relates to. But they also establish the price, the mechanism for delivery, the date of delivery, the size of the contract, the number of units of the related security or commodity, buyer and seller of a forward contract negotiate all aspects of their contractual relationship between one another. What about a futures contract? Well, all futures are exchange traded third party contracts. Now note the diagram at the bottom. The contract is created by a trade between the counterparties the buyer and the seller, the long and the short. But the only thing the buyer and seller negotiate is the price at which they will trade the contract they've agreed to trade. The exchange where the contract has been traded establishes all the other terms of the contract. The number of units, pounds, ounces, par value, whatever the case may be. The delivery dates, the way it's being quoted. So the only thing the buyer and seller of a futures contract negotiate is the price at which they're going to make the trade. However, note I refer to them as third-party contracts, unlike the bilateral contracts that I refer to forward contracts as. Because note at the very bottom of the diagram for futures, there's three parties there. Seller or short on one side, buyer or long on the other side, but in between the two is a clearinghouse. Because as soon as the trade is made between the buyer and seller of futures, the trade is confirmed to the clearinghouse, 
And as long as the clearinghouse gets matching confirms from the buyer and seller, the clearinghouse will accept the position. Now, what are the implications of introducing a third party? Because to the eye, clearly that bottom diagram looks a lot more complicated than the bilateral contract we described the forward contract as. The picture is, of course, more complicated, but by introducing the clearinghouse and having it step in between the buyer and seller, it actually increases a lot of efficiencies. Because one, the clearinghouse now being a party to every contract is in a position to guarantee performance. Note in the bilateral contract, there's no independent party guaranteeing performance. So counterparty credit risk is a feature of over-the-counter bilateral contracts. And of course, market participants are aware of that. They size up the counterparty to assess their credit worthiness and where appropriate will demand or possibly even exchange collateral. But with a futures contract, you're greatly reducing not the need to do a credit assessment, but the number of counterparties for whom you have to do a credit assessment. You only need to assess the credit worthiness of the clearinghouse, not the counterparty you're trading with. And since clearing organizations are large, well-capitalized entities, that greatly reduces concerns about counterparty credit risk. The other advantage? Well, let's bring a new diagram into play. On this diagram, I've got trades executed between five different pairs of counterparties. The arrows connecting the long and the shorts indicating the parties with whom the trades were executed. And initially I simply have the clearinghouse silhouetted in the background. But let's now change that after the clearinghouse has accepted the position. You'll note now the clearinghouse has become the legal counterparty to all buyers and sellers. So the buyers still have their long positions and the sellers still have their short positions, but no longer against one another, they now have those positions against the clearinghouse. The marketing literature that comes out of the derivative exchanges will succinctly summarize that situation by saying the clearinghouse becomes a buyer to all sellers and a seller to all buyers. Now what's the benefit? Well, aside from the reduction in counterparty credit risk I identified earlier, the second benefit is ease of offset. Because in a bilateral contract, in most cases, there's only one way out. If you don't want to take the contract all the way to delivery, you have to go to the counterparty and get them to agree to an early termination. With the clearinghouse setup diagrammed here, you'll note since the clearinghouse is the legal counterparty, all one needs to do to offset a position is to find some other market participant willing to take the other side of the trade one would need to take to reverse their initial position. So a long, a buyer with a long position wouldn't have to go back to the short with whom they traded to initiate their position. They might find some other short that's looking to offset their obligation to make delivery. And if the long sells the contract they own to the short looking to terminate, it takes them both out of the market. But a long looking to terminate their obligation to take delivery doesn't need to find a short who's looking to offset their obligation to make delivery. Another possibility, there might be a new market participant wanting to enter into a long position. And if an existing long sells the contracts they own to a new market entrant, the previous long has now exited the market and the new long has now picked up their contractual obligation versus the clearinghouse. So summarizing the second benefit, ease of offset of positions. So the two advantages for third-party contracts, that is exchange-traded derivatives, or clear derivatives more generally, is reduction in counterparty credit risk and ease of offset. Now, that's not to say that bilateral contracts have no advantages. They do, and that's in terms of the ability to negotiate the terms of the contract. Futures contracts, or more generally exchange-traded derivatives, are standardized. You have no ability to negotiate any aspect of the contract other than the price. But bilateral contracts can be negotiated to meet precisely the terms of the exposure the counterparties are trying to initiate or offset. So bilateral contracts can be negotiated not only over what security or commodity one is creating the derivative relative to, but also the timing of delivery and the size of the transaction, thus allowing the bilateral contracts to negotiate it in a way that will more precisely 
create or offset the sorts of market exposures that is desired on the part of the party to the trade. I hope you enjoyed this video. You can go to our YouTube channel or Facebook page to see other videos on a range of investment related topics. Or you can go to the website, insidersguidetofinance.com. At our website, in addition to the free video shorts, there are a series of modestly priced in-depth training videos with running times of approximately one hour each that go into a number of subjects in greater detail. The website and Facebook page also contain information about open enrollment programs I will be presenting over the next few months and my recently released book, The Insider's Guide to Fixed Income Securities and Markets.